So welcome back. We've been discussing, uh, again, the industrial side or I side of I.O. psychology, and that's primarily focused on the measurement of performance, the measurement of jobs, and the measurement of predictors of performance. So we've kind of talked about how we want to measure performance and manage performance based on a job analysis, that the job analysis is a measurement of the job itself that is going to guide these further attempts, and that we've just finished talking about um, selection tests, tests that we actually are wanting to use to predict performance before we actually have that performance data. So today we're going to be talking about actually putting some of this together and how we use those tests to make selection decisions and also how we test to make sure that those selection tests are working the way we think they are. As always, just a reminder of the readings that are due. Um, also, at the bottom of each one of these intro slides, there's information about when the quiz and if there's any other additional um, assignments that are due around this lecture. So selection decision and personnel law. We're going to be talking about how we actually create a set of selectors. So test to select future performance. We're going to be talking about different ways to combine selection tools or tests in order to make the decisions of who to hire or not. So again, we're very focused on recruitment and selection in this chapter. We're focusing on how we get people to apply to an organization, and once they apply, how we can test them, hoping to predict whether or not they will be a high-performing um, employee. And finally, we're going to discuss the laws that govern what organizations can do with selection and the potential legal risks of various selection techniques. So a brief review of selection. Um, so a selection battery is simply a term referring to a set of predictors or a set of tests that are used to make a hiring decision. So as always, our first step is the job analysis. We're wanting to conduct this job analysis to determine the, and, the, and to describe and to specify the job. So And that is going to help us to develop and select predictors. So again, the job analysis has got those knowledge, skills, and abilities that are been found to be related to the actual task performance. So when we're creating a selection test, we're wanting to create tests which are going to capture either one of those knowledge, skills, and abilities that are core to being good at your job, or one of the specific tasks that are required in the job to make sure that you actually do that task. So once we have that, generally speaking, we're going to have more than one test. Multiple tests likely increase the proportion of criteria endurance accounted for. And again, what we're trying to predict here is the criterion, that measure of performance. We're taking potential employees, giving them a series of tests that have been found to be related to performance later in actual employees to try to predict which employees would be the best for the job. So selection broadly refers to other personnel decisions as well. So whenever we're talking about selection, we're usually talking about kind of the scientific application of measurement of someone's performance or potential to perform to make personnel decisions, promotions, layoffs, etc. However, generally, all of those cases, we're selecting people. We're selecting people for promotions. We're selecting people to be terminated or fired. We're selecting people to maybe, unfortunately, have a layoff. But generally, when we talk about selection, most people are thinking about actually hiring. So we're going to mainly focus on that level. So here's a quick example of a selection battery. So in the last lecture, we were talking about the validity coefficient of individual selection tests. The idea that each test has a certain amount of relationship with actual performance. And we also talked about the idea of incremental validity. So let's take a quick look at this example. What we have here is a multiple test battery. We have three different selection tests being used to try to predict future performance in an employee. We've got an interview, we've got an assessment center, and we've got a work sample. So generally speaking, what we're looking at here is we're wanting to figure out how much of the variance is actually being explained by each one. And when we talk about validity coefficients in the last set of uh, last lectures, we were talking about if they were being used as the only selection device. And you can kind of see what I was trying to talk about in that last section when you look at this chart. So if you look at the um, overlap between assessment centers and work samples, that overlap is being explained by one or the other, but it's not explained by both of them at the same time. And what I mean by that is that if we put work samples in first, if that's the first thing that we look at to explain performance, it's going to explain all of the dark red section between work samples and criterion performance. 
And then if the next predictor we put in is interview, it's going to predict all of that kind of purple green overlap, the R squared of 0 0.10. But if assessment centers are added third, the only part it's going to explain is the incremental validity that it adds above and beyond what has already been explained by work sample and interview. So the only part that it would add at that point is just that purple section in the middle. So multiple R is a correlation between the combination of predictors and criterions. So the test battery's multiple R is 0.74. And that's the idea of the amount of variance that it is explaining as a total. So all the variance being explained by work samples, assessment centers, and interviews together. Now if we actually combined just the single R of work sample by itself, the single R of assessment center, and the single R of interviews, that number would actually be higher because each one would get credit for the overlap. So the overlap between assessment centers and work samples would be both represented by the total variance explained by assessment centers and the total variance explained by work samples. And that would give us an inflated value. So when we're talking about a test battery's multiple R, we're talking about how much total variance is explained, regardless of where it's coming from. So this particular test battery is explained in R of 0.74. Again, the effect size or the percentage of variance explained is R squared. 0.74 times 0.74 is approximately 0.55. So this assessment battery is predicting about 55% of, of performance. Now, a lot of times when we talk about how much of performance we're expecting, so let's say that you were actually hiring for a job and you used absolutely no selection battery. You didn't use a single selector. At that point, basically, you're just going to be hiring people on a flip of a coin. You may get some great performers. You may get some poor performers. Adding just an interview is only going to explain about 10% of the variance in performance. So it's not like putting just the interview in is going to give you a really good idea of who um, performer, the best performers are. But it is going to give you a bump in the right direction. Because you're explaining 10% of performance, if you use that interview and only hire people that did well in that interview, you are now more likely to get more people that will perform well than for people that will perform poorly. So if you assume that your population that you're drawing from is filled with a 50-50 blend, half of them are good workers and half of them are bad workers. No selection technique, you're going to get half good and half bad workers. If you put in interviews, that might shift it to you get 55 good workers to 45 bad workers. And that seems like a small shift, but still, that's moving in the right direction. You'll have to get rid of less people. You'll have more productivity. And as you add each predictor, even if you're not explaining all of performance, the more performance you explain, the more and more confident you can be that you're going to get a larger portion of quality workers and a smaller portion of poor or underperforming workers. Um, I often like to think about it as far as like a gambling reference. Of It is basically... Doing selection batteries and doing this kind of work is not going to guarantee you a win every time. But it's going to give you better than 50-50 odds. It's putting the advantage in your pocket that you're more often than not going to be making the right decision. So recruitment is an important part of selection. and We're not going to talk a lot about recruitment, but I do want to talk about the fact that in order for these selection techniques to work, you have to have a large enough pool that you have the ability to make a selection from. Again, if you have 10 job openings that have to be filled and you only have 10 people apply for them, well, you have no choice. You don't need to do selection at that point. You have to bring all 10 in. So the more people that are applying for a job, the more useful selection techniques are. So if you have 10 openings for a job, and you have 100 people apply, and you've got a selection battery that predicts about 55% of, of performance on a job, using that selection technique, the 10 people out of that 100 you hire are most likely going to be much more likely to be top performers. So recruitment is the process of actually making sure that the selection pool, the number of people applying for any job that you're going to use a selec selection battery to hire with, is large enough to where that selection battery is going to be able to work. So it's the process of encouraging potential qualified applicants to seek employment with a particular company. Quality or efficiency of selection systems is limited by applicant quality and quantity. 
So it's not just quantity, but it's also quality. So again, if you recruit for a doctor's position and no one that applies actually has the prerequisite skills, knowledge, and training to be a doctor, again, recruitment has failed. So it's not just about getting the numbers up. It's also about getting the quality of the numbers up. Traditional methods a lot of organizations use include college placement offices, newspaper ads, employee referrals, and job fairs. There's a lot of ways to get that information out. And broadly speaking, and we'll talk about this more much later in this class when we start talking about the organizational side, when we start talking about kind of perceptions of organizations and organizational culture, um, organizations also, the better reputation an organization has, the easier it is to do recruitment. Recent research suggests that organizations' reputation and organizational values are considered by recruits. And this is especially true when the economy is doing well. So when the economy is doing well, that means a lot of people are getting jobs. There's less people on the job market, which means they're harder to get a large pool of people to apply for a job. Especially in those kind of situations, people are very picky on the kind of organizations they want to work for. So organizational values do affect recruits' attraction to the organization, especially if the economy is doing well. Now, if the economy is not doing as well. People are a little bit more willing to take any job they can get. And then this is a, less, is a smaller factor in the part of recruitment. But it is an important thing to communicate to organizations. And it's another, thing, another way that I and O, industrial organizational psychologists, make their points. Is It's not just that you need good recruitment for good selection. You need to also think about how your organization is perceived because that's going to help get good recruitment. Recruitment is also the importance of person environment fit. So we've been co keep coming back to this idea that um, IO psychologists want to measure the environment, the job, and the organization. They want to measure the people, so most their performance, but also their knowledge, skills, and abilities. And a part of selection isn't just about finding the best person that's going to be the highest performer for a company. It's also about finding people that are going to be a good fit for the organization because those people are more likely to be satisfied with their work. They're more likely to be um, loyal to the organization, and they're more likely to stay longer term with that organization. As far as modern trends in recruitment, obviously the internet now plays a major role. Um, general job boards, organizations own websites, a lot of research has found that recruitment is strongly affected by the ease of use and the information that's provided on websites um, for organizations that are in the process for recruitment. Um, additionally, online sites such as LinkedIn, um, if you're interested in becoming an IO psychologist or even just in general, I would strongly encourage you to start considering having a LinkedIn account as a social media site that is professional. Um, so definitely not a place to be posting pictures of you out having fun over the weekend. Uh, save that for some other site. But um, LinkedIn is a valuable tool, and a lot of organizations are looking at LinkedIn as a way to recruit people. I personally have received approximately, let me be, well, let me not be approximate. I've had five contracted jobs come to me through LinkedIn. And that's not me actively trying to get a job. That's just I have a LinkedIn profile. I've put all my information out there. And I've included the types of consulting work that I'm open for. And I've basically been cold contacted by organizations, one of them a fairly large organization, wanting me to come in on a project. So LinkedIn is another great way. Um, and similar sites. Monster.com is another job search site. There's a lot of them out there. PSYOP, the Society for Industrial Organizational Psychology, also has job search boards online now. So selection decisions. Um, we've been discussing validity. Again, this truthfulness. Validity refers to how truthful our measurement of what we think we're measuring is, and it also refers to is it related to what we think it is. So um, selection must be based on valid tests. Those tests need to be um, found to represent what they're meant to represent. So again, when we're selecting a test, we're trying to find a test that's going to capture a key component of the job that we're selecting for based on the job analysis. So if that test isn't really capturing that component, that means it's not valid. Beyond that, once we actually collect the information, we want to make sure that test is strongly related to performance and performance measures in the job. That's also another way that we validate the test. There's two general approaches to demonstrating the validity of a selection battery, and most organizations that have a strong selection system are going to want to be using either one or the other of these to basically provide both evidence to themselves that their selection process is working, but also for legal protection reasons.
The first one is an actual validity study, and the second one is a validity, validity generalization. So we're going to talk about the validity study first, and there's a couple of ways we can do validity studies. We can do predictive validity studies, concurrent validity studies. We can also do cross-validation studies, and I'll talk about each one of those in the upcoming slides. Validity generalization is that we don't actually do a specific study on our selection battery in the organization we're working on. We do basically a literature review of all of the published research on that, that selection test, to build up a argument that it is a valid predictor for our job. So predictive validity investigates how effective a predictor is at forecasting applicant job performance. And this is a longer term study and it's the best way to do validity if you've got the time and resources. So the steps for a predictive validity study is first we're going to gather predicted predictor data on appl all applicants. So basically we're going to start collecting data on the selection tests of everyone we bring in. We're going to hire some of those applicants to fill open positions. Now again, most likely this needs to be where we're going to get enough people to be able to do statistical analysis. So if you are only hiring one person a year, it may take a very long time for you to gather enough data to actually do a predictive validity study. Generally speaking, you're wanting about 10 to 20 people per predictor. So if you have a selection battery with three different tests, you're going to be wanting about 60 to 80 people before you can actually run a predictive validity study. So this is pretty easy to gather if what the job you're hiring for is uh, at a larger company with a lot of actual open job positions in a year. On a smaller company, it may take two or three years to gather this information. But again, this is the first step. You're gathering the predictor data on all applicants. You're making your hiring decisions based on that predictor data. And then from those hired applicants, you're going to then track their actual performance once they get the job. So after several months, you gather performance data, the criteria or criterion for this validation study. And usually you're going to gather one large, basically a single measure of performance. You're then going to run a statistical analysis to compute the validity coefficient between those predictors and their performance. If you find a strong relationship, you've got predictive validity. Not only was my selectors good at, hi at fi figuring out who to hire, once I hired them, the people that were expected to do the best actually did the best. Now, a problem with predictive validity study is it doesn't necessarily give us one important piece of information. How would the people that we chose not to hire, how would they have done? So there is a limitation built into this process, and it is built into almost all validity studies that unless you're willing to hire everyone that you measure, good and bad, and then see how they perform, usually we're predicting validity on how well it predicts performance on people we've already predicted are going to be, generally speaking, higher performers. Concurrent validation is cheaper and easier and quicker. A concurrent validity study um, are more uh, viable than predictive validity studies, and that viability simply means they're easier to do and they're cheaper. The steps for a concurrent validity study is you take people that, are er that already have the job, and you then have them take the predictors. So you collect the predictor data at the same time you're collecting performance data, or that you already have perform for performance data for. So you're basically using incumbents. And then you look again to see, is there a relationship between how these people scored on your predictor test and how they're actually performing? If you find a strong relationship, again, you have argument for validity. So you compute the validity coefficient to assess the strength of the relationship between the predictor and, again, the performance or criterion score. The limitation here is that you're actually, one, your sample is no longer motivated to necessarily do well on a selection test. So when you give selection tests to applicants, you know you're going to get their full attention and they're going to try to do their best. If you give those same selection tests to people that already have the job, there's not a lot of motivation for them to do well. So right there brings into some question about if you don't find a strong relationship, it might not be that those selectors are bad. It may just be that your sample didn't take them seriously. Finally, we're now predicting performance of people that have already been at the company for a while. That performance itself may have stabilized a little bit. And generally, we wanted to predict how people are going to perform once we hire them. So again, a few limitations. It's cheaper, but it's also a little less trustable in the data that it gives us. So the major differences between predictive and concurrent validity studies. In concurrent validation, we're looking at incumbents, not applicants. The predictors and the criteria are measured at the same time. So 
for example, in the element, so for participants in a concurrent study, it's incumbents. In a predictive study, it's applicants. In a concurrent study, we're collecting the predictor data, the selection tests, and the performance data at the same time, time one and time one. In a predictive study, we're collecting the selection, the prediction measurement, in time one, and then we're collecting actual performance from those applicants once they've been hired at time two. The selection decision in a concurrent um, study has already been done before time one. They've already been selected. They're already in the company. In predictive studies, it's made between time one and time two. We collect the data, and then we hire or not hire. And then if we hire them, we collect performance at time two. And in both cases, we're looking at the validity coefficient is the same. We're just looking at the relationship or how much those selectors, the predictors, predicted performance. Now, when we do a validity study, there becomes a problem with it is, generally speaking, a statistical artifact, if you will, or a statistical artifact refers to a problem with the equation. And a problem with the equation with correlations is they tend to be best on the actual sample they're conducted. In other words, when you're doing a correlation, the statistical model that's being created is trying to come up with the very best fit between your predictors and your outcomes. In other words, your selection test and your performance. It's going to look and come up with an R that explains the very best fitting explanation of that data. But we're now going to use that to suggest that that's what we would find in every other sample. Generally, we don't find this. We actually find that the validity tends to shrink a little bit on new samples. So for instance, if you find in one study that your selection battery explains 30% of performance in a concurrent validity study, if you just started using that selection as instrument and continuously thought you were explaining 30% of variance in performance, you had actually found if you put that to the test, it might be explaining a little bit less. This is often referred to as validity shrinkage, and it's fairly common. So if we really want to know how much performance we're um, explaining, we need to do a cross-validation study after we do our regular validation study. So we do a regular validation study, either concurrent or predictive, and then a couple months later with a new group of people applying to the organization, we would rerun that study. So we must cross-validate applying, applying the same predictors and criteria to a brand new sample. We then calculate the predicted score from the first sample. So in other words, we'd go, based on the data we gathered the first time we ran this study, we would expect your performance to be this. We're now going to see, based on the actual new sample, we again measured predictors and we measured performance, what actually was your performance. The difference between what you'd predict from the first sample and the performance you found for real in the second sample is usually going to be a little bit less. In other words, their performance is going to be a little lower than we predict. The difference between these is the shrinkage. So we basically compare the effect size that we predict from our first sample to the actual effect size we find in the second sample. The smaller the difference, the better. And generally this difference gives us a good idea of the shrinkage and that second number is usually more accurate than the first. So just to sum up before I start talking about validity generalization, cross-validation is an additional technique that we can use to be more certain about how strong a relationship we have between our predictors and eventual performance. So most organizations are going to probably do a validity study, especially of a new selection device. They're either going to do a concurrent or predictive study. The cross-validation is more of they should do that as well. Some of them do, some of them don't. So another way to validate a selection procedure that doesn't involve collecting data, and this is a great technique to go to, especially if you're looking at a smaller group of people being selected. So again, to do a validation study, a can, uh, basically a predictive, a concurrent validity study, or even a cross-validation study, you need relatively large sample sizes. You're needing 40, 60, 80, 100 applicants, and then you need to gather the data on them and their performance data to be able to run this. So that's not 100 applicants. That's 100 applicants that you also hire so that you also have their performance data. So sometimes this is either too costly um, there's not enough time to do it, there's not enough participants, it's a smaller organization. So a company can still make an effort to validate their selection through a technique called val validity generalization. It's an alternate to concurrent or predictive validity. It involves using meta-analytic techniques 
to weigh and combine validity coefficients across situations to determine if validity is generalizable across situations. So this is usually not being done by the organization itself. It's often being done by an organization looking for one of these meta-analytic published articles that has found, for example, that cognitive ability is a strong predictor across a vast array of jobs. So the research supports the idea that validity does generalize. Um, and there are a fair amount of types, like, for example, interviews tend to generalize across multiple samples. Cognitive ability tends to generalize across many, many different types of jobs. Personality, for the most part, has been found, especially conscientiousness and emotional stability, to be somewhat related to performance in a lot of jobs. Therefore, if you didn't have time to do an actual validity study and you needed to come up with a selection technique, you could go, well, we're going to do structured interviews, a cognitive ability test, and a personality test because there's a fair amount of evidence in the research that these are all fairly generalizable to many, many types of jobs. The problem with this, though, is situational specificity. It's a belief that's also supported somewhat by data that test validities are very limited to particular situations. Now think about this. We were just talking about the idea of cross-validation, that when you actually bother to do a full statistical analysis to determine how effective your selection battery is, that still, the next time you use it with a brand new sample, it's not going to be quite as strong. Well, this validity generalization is the idea that we're taking coefficients from big giant studies and trying to apply them to our specific situation. Again, generally, this isn't a bad idea, but the actual success of those selection techniques is probably going to be weaker in our specific situation. So some of the issues with validity generalization, there are many criticisms concerned about the statistical methodology used in validity generalization. So validity generalization is using meta-analysis, which basically analyzes published studies. Well, studies that are published tend to be the studies that find very big or meaningful differences or effects. So if you're doing a meta-analysis of cognitive ability tests predicting performance, most of the studies that get published are going to be the ones that actually found that which means that you're probably missing a lot of studies that didn't get published that may have found that it didn't affect performance in some certain situations. Validity generalization is limited to jobs similar to those in which the test was originally validated. So again, if you have a meta-analysis that looks and finds that personality tests um, generalize greatly across all sorts of social work roles and customer relation roles and retail positions, but then you're trying to use that to justify using a personality test to hire for auto mechanics. At that point, it's not going to be as good. In fact, validity generalization requires a little bit of kind of common sense and logic from the person applying it. Does this research really generalize to the job you're trying to generalize it to? Because no test or measure is a good predictor for every single job. Validity generalization is seen somewhat favorably by courts, and what I mean by that is that if you have a selection technique with no validation and it's challenged, you're probably in trouble legally. If you have a validation test and you can bring hard, predictive, or concurrent and cross-validation studies that show it's a very strong predictor of performance, you are very legally sound at that point. Courts generally also, not quite as strong, do also support validity generalization. So if, again, if an organization is being challenged on its selection techniques and they present a five or ten page report written by an industrial organizational psychologist or an HR specialist that cites all of the meta-analyses studies that show that these predictors are related to performance in this type of job, that also is generally seen as sufficient evidence that the organization has done its homework in validating the test that it's using.